So now that we've covered inheritance, let's go ahead and talk about its sibling. They're really sort of joined at the hip, like Siamese twins or Janus, the two-faced god. You know, they're, they're always, they always go together. And uh, we're going to talk about what polymorphism is and how Java supports it. And this, um, this somewhat whimsical cartoon gives you an analogy for, for, for polymorphism. So this, uh, this person is saying, now speak, right? And the dog object says woof, the duck says quack, the cat says meow. So, so each of those classes would have a method called speak, which would be called, and each subclass would know how to speak, right? That's, that's what that's supposed to be saying. All right, so let's talk about polymorphism. Polymorphism and inheritance are pretty much almost always used together. Uh, in fact, it's pretty rare to use inheritance without polymorphism. We talked about inheritance by itself just to introduce the concept, but they really do go together like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to imagine one without the other. Having said that, of course, there are other ways to get polymorphism without using inheritance, and we'll talk about some of them later. But uh, for example, in a language like C or C++, you can have function pointers, and that's a way to get polymorphism without having inheritance. But that's not what we're covering, and that's not really what's supported in Java. Polymorphism enables transparent customization or specialization of methods that are inherited from a superclass. That's the key mystical part of this. And these features are used to implement a very important design principle called the open-closed principle. You can read more about it here at this Wikipedia link. So the open-closed principle says a class should be open for extension. In other words, you can modify and customize its behavior, but closed for modification. And what that means is, ideally, the interface of the superclass is relatively fixed, or maybe very fixed, never changes. And so you can always count on the interface being the same, even though the implementations may change. And the reason for doing this is to insulate the clients of a class so that the, the clients being the users of the class or the class hierarchy, so that they stay identical, the clients stay identical, even if the implementation is changed. And that, of course, if you do it right, makes your software a lot more robust, a lot more flexible, a lot more reusable, because things can be added without breaking existing code, which is a hugely important thing, especially as software projects get bigger, right? Because then you have a lot more stuff that might come along and, and break things. So you can take a look at this link, which is an article that talks about the open-closed principle, which is one of the fundamental design principles in software. You can use, well, let me rephrase. There are many software design patterns. Hopefully, you've learned about design patterns in earlier classes, like 251 or so on. And the open close principle is at the heart of many, many of these patterns. So here's one pattern hopefully you've seen before, the, the factory method pattern. We'll see this used all over the place in our discussions, where you basically have a creator class with a factory method. And that factory method makes something. And it, what it makes is a product. But what's cool about this is you can come along and you can subclass from the creator to make a concrete creator. And that factory method can make a concrete product. But all the client code needs to know about are creators and products. They don't need to know about the specific details of concrete creators or concrete products. And then you can write a lot of code that uses products and creators. And you can add all this other stuff. And the code that uses this never knows, never cares that you've customized and specialized the implementation. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. You can take a look at it. If you define your class hierarchy using the open-close principle, you end up with subclasses that can define or redefine their custom behaviors that are more suitable for particular use cases. And that's the beauty of this whole thing. Let's kind of give an example here. So uh, the neat part is you can still have the same structure and the functionality that you get from the superclass, but then you customize the places where differences occur. So as an example, we, we kind of talked about this before, but I'll cover it in a little bit more detail. Here in Java is an abstract class called an abstract list, and it's got methods like get and set and remove and is empty, not unlike kind of the stuff you're doing for the assignment with array. And we then have subclasses like vector and array list. 
and these implement these extend abstract list and then they do things that are specific for each of the different kinds of abstract data types and uh, you might have to uh, kind of look around a little bit to figure out why these are different classes and what they do but if you take a look at this link here it explains the difference between ArrayList and Vector and one big difference between ArrayList and Vector is that Vector all of Vector's methods are synchronized so they will be able to work on a vector that's shared between multiple threads in a concurrent program without worrying about corruption, whereas ArrayList does not have synchronized methods. So as a consequence, ArrayList is much more efficient than Vector, but ArrayList does not protect its state from concurrent modifications, which you may or may not care about depending on what you're doing, but that's one of the differences. So same interface, different implementation. So let's talk about method overriding. That's really the as we talked about before, that's really the sweet spot of polymorphism. So the way this works in Java, as well as in languages like C++ and C Sharp and Python and so on, they all work more or less the same, is you end up with a reference or a pointer, if you're in C++, but if you're in Java, you have a reference to a superclass, and you can call methods via that reference, and those methods are then automatically delegated to the appropriate subclass instance. And I'll talk more about that. It's a really important concept. You don't have to know the implementation details to make it work for you, but I'll talk about them because they're interesting. So to make this more concrete, we're going to look at this abstraction here. Abstract set, we'll have a couple different kinds of sets. And what we do here is we can have subclass methods like add or iterator or whatnot that are going to be able to override methods defined in the superclass. And we'll use a little bit of syntax here just to make this uh, easy to understand. So if something is in italics, that means it's abstract. That means you don't have a definition of it. If it's not in italics, that means it's concrete. It actually has an implementation. Yeah? Uh, what's the difference in, between an abstract class and an interface? Ah, great question. question. The question is, what's the difference between an abstract class and an interface? <clears throat> well, back in the Java 7 days, there was a, a real easy way to keep the distinction. Back in Java 7 days, interfaces couldn't have implementations of methods. So an abstract class was clearly different because it could have implementations of methods. It didn't have to have all the methods implemented, but it could have some, um, whereas an interface could not. Right? Uh, with Java 8, classes can ha or interfaces now can have default methods. So now what's the difference? Well, the main difference is that interfaces in Java 8 still cannot have fields that are non-static. So you can have fields, non-static fields, data members if you're a C++ programmer, you'd have non-static fields in abstract classes, but interfaces cannot have um, non-static fields. That's the main difference. But they're, they're getting more and more similar. That's why I said that interfaces in Java 8 are sort of, you know, they're, they're becoming, you know, like teenagers basically, right? They're, they're growing up a little bit. Um, any non-final and or non-static methods can be overridden. If something is final, then it, if it's a final method, it means you can't override it by the, by the name. And if it's static, you can't override it either. But if it's non-static, non-final, you can't override it. So let's take a look at an example. Here is abstract set, which has a bunch of methods as well as some fields. And so we have iterator and add. And uh, iterator returns an iterator that can be used to access each element in a set. Add will be used to say how to add an element to the set. Remember, there's only one element that you can have per, per set because it's not a multi-set. It's a set with unique values. And then we have a whole bunch of different kinds of sets. We have tree sets. We'll, we'll talk about them in a second. And these different types of sets can override, add, and iterate and implement them in different ways. Uh, and the way that they distinguish the, the implementations that are different is they have different time and space trade-offs. So a tree set is going to do things in one way. It's going to be implemented as a, a balanced binary tree. So by the way, remember your, your 201 uh, O notation. What's the key benefit of having something that's a balanced binary tree? What's the thing that makes it special? What's the asymptotic time complexity for operations? Uh, the search is log n. Right, so search, insert, and remove will always be O of log n, which is really cool, right? That's actually very fast. In fact, if you really think about it for a second, in any 
computer where you use abstract data types that have finite sizes, right? Like a tree of ints, right? Or a tree of longs that really is O of 1. And why is that? Because it's a constant, right? So if you're really being picky, it's, it's constant. Of course, if you start using infinite precision values, it would no longer be O of 1. But uh, basically, it's, it's super fast. So that's a, a tree set. A hash set, anybody remember what a hash, how hashing is? What's the characteristic of a hash lookup? What's the average case asymptotic time complexity for operations like add, find, remove? Yeah? O of 1, right? If your hash function works well, it should distribute things nice and evenly, and so they're typically one lookup. What's the downside with, with hashing, though? Where, where can it go awry? Right, so if you collide, then all of a sudden you may end up with you know, linear search, right? If you have certain kinds of hash sets. Now it turns out that Java has actually got some cool implementations, so some of their hash sets actually use balanced trees. So you have a, a, a hash table of balanced trees. So now we're back to log n again. And they did that for a variety of reasons I won't go into now, but it's, it's pretty cool. There's also something called concurrent hash set. And uh, concurrent hash set is actually not in Java, but there's an implementation of it in my, I have an implementation of it because I needed to use it for the, uh, for the lookup that I do in some of the, the uh, image crawler and image counter applications. And in that case, you can do all kinds of magical things. It'll, it'll work really efficiently in multi-threaded environments and so on. And we'll talk about that more later. So assuming that we've got all these different implementations, we can use our good friend the factory method pattern in order to be able to make ourselves the appropriate type of subclass, but then access it via an instance or a reference to a superclass object. So that's what you're seeing here. So if you can see this up here, we call make set, which is just a factory method, and it'll return the appropriate one of these things based on the type that's passed in. And once we've got that, then the dispatching that takes place at runtime will take into account the concrete type of whatever type of abstract set instant instantiation we have, and that will be the appropriate method called. So it'll call the right method. So it looks like it's calling through the abstract set, but of course, in reality, it's actually calling whatever the abstract set is implemented by as returned by the factory. And maybe inside that factory, we have a switch statement or an if else statement or a lookup in a table or whatever. We get to find the right implementation. This is basically the factory method pattern plus the open closed principle. And that's what polymorphism is great at doing. OK, so let's take a look at an example now. Um, this is an example. You can go here to my website and take a look and see it. And what it does is it basically kind of wraps these classes around the Java classes just to show by putting printouts what's happening under the hood. And so what we do here is we have a factory method that will make the appropriate set based on the argument that's passed in. I don't show that code here, but that's what's going on. And it comes back as what I call a simple abstract set. And that just allows me to interpose some print statements so you can see what's happening. And then I can make a, a tree set or a hash set or a concurrent hash set or whatever, right? And then I go ahead and I put a bunch of calls. And, and depending on which one I've made, when I make these calls, it'll print out something saying what's going on. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, it says, I am Iron Man. Anybody know who, who wrote that song? No, no, no? Black Sabbath, very good. Get 10 points, um, <clears throat> like, like Gryffindor. Uh, and because this is a set, it'll only have one Iron Man, right? This call here will, will be ignored because it's already got an entry under Iron Man. Um, <clears throat> And so the factory method is what makes this thing. And then the put and iterator methods we see here will do the right thing based on what concrete class was actually created by the factory method. So down here, when we call iterator, what we're going to do is we're going to iterator back to this thing. And then we're going to iterate through it. And we'll talk more about iterators later. But basically, it calls has next to see if there's anything else to iterate over. 
And if there is, we go ahead and call next in order to get its value and print it out in this case. And those things are dispatched based on the concrete type that was established when the factory method was called to make the appropriate subclass of our simple abstract set superclass. OK, any questions about that? The next thing I'm going to cover relatively quickly, we have some time, so I don't have to rush through this, is how is this stuff actually done under the hood? Right? It's, it's kind of seems like magic, but it's, it's pretty cool. And once you know how it works, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty obvious. Um, you, but keep in mind, you don't have to know all this stuff in order to use Java. You might have to know this stuff in order to get 100 on the quiz, but you don't have to know this stuff in order to be able to use Java. Um, and so what happens here, as we'll talk about, is just knowing a bit more about how the virtual machine works will make you a more effective full stack developer, which is a highly coveted thing that people are often looking for these days, because it'll, it'll help us know what's going on under the hood. It also, and this knowledge I'm about to impart upon you, will also help you become more effective at striking a balance between flexibility and efficiency. And that's often a, a design trade-off. If you recall your data structures course, they probably talk about time-space trade-offs. And this is a good example of, of the trade-offs we often have to think about in computing. So what happens in Java is that when your Java code is run through the Java compiler, Java C, or whatever your IDE uses to access Java C, it spits out bytecode. And the bytecode has a bunch of opcodes in it. And one of the opcodes in there is, is a, an opcode called invoke virtual. And invoke virtual implements dynamic dispatch or dynamic dispatching. And that's what we're about to talk about. So what dynamic dispatching is used for is it, that's what's used under the hood to dispatch the methods that are non-final and non-static. Right? If they're final or static, it behaves differently. But if they're non-final, non-static, then it's dispatched dynamically. And when you override stuff, then the appropriate subclass methods are what are chosen in order to do the, the actual implementation of the method. There's another name for this stuff. This is more of a sort of a C++ term, but it, it found its way into Java terminology as well because the mechanism is more or less the same. It's often called virtual method invocation or virtual method calls or virtual method dispatching and so on. Um, so Dynamic dispatch is the default dispatching mechanism in Java. If you don't do anything else to your methods, if you just say, you know, void, foo, open paren, close paren, blop, blop, that foo method will be dynamically dispatched. There are some things you can do to change that, like you can put private, or you can say static, you can say final. That'll change the behavior. But by default, dynamic dispatching is what you get out of the box with Java. In contrast, in a language like C++, Static dispatch is the default, and you have to actually say virtual on something to get it to be dynamically dispatched. Any non-final, non-static method or non-private method can be overridden from the superclass. So, and these are the things under which you can't override it, private, final, or static. Let's pretend for the moment like those don't exist, just to make the point. Um, and here's how it works under the hood. Whenever a class is compiled in Java, and, and by the way, C++ works essentially the same way, a so-called virtual table or V table is automatically generate, generated, and that table contains the addresses of the dynamically dispatched methods. So as you can see here, we're going to have you know, hash set, abstract set, and so on and so forth. And if I have an instance of, say, hash set, then that is going to have a pointer to its V table. We'll talk about what goes in the V table in a second. And then it's got a bunch of other stuff, right? It's got various fields and so on. Um, this is the abstract set. So the abstract set's going to have a couple of fields. And then you'll notice when we inherit hash set from abstract set, it has those first three fields, pointer to vtable, key set field, values field. Those are the same. And then it has some other fields that it adds on, right? So one way to think about the Im implementation of inheritance is concatenation of records or concatenation of the fields. Let's ignore that state for a moment and focus on the methods. So this pointer, this vtable pointer, points to a vtable or virtual table. And the virtual table contains pointers to the methods that actually implement the code. Now what happens here, as you can see, is that there will be some methods that are 
defined in the superclass. And that's what you get by default if you don't override them. And then there are other methods that will be either overridden or implemented for the first time. If they were abstract in the superclass, they'll be overridden and or implemented in the subclass. And so this virtual table will contain pointers to those methods. But here's the cool part. If the abstract class defines methods, even if they're not implemented, they are always going to occur in the same slot location in the virtual table. And so let's just say, for sake of argument, you know, slot 1. This is slot 0. That's slot 1. Let's say that, for sake of argument, that's the, the add method or something like that. The add method for this class is at the same place as here. Or maybe a better one is isEmpty. The isEmpty method will be the same place here as it is there. And so the code that's omitted by the compiler simply has to go and index through the vPointer to find the vTable, and then go find that offset in the vTable and call whatever method happens to be there. And if it's the one that was from the superclass, it'll be that implementation. But if it was overridden by the subclass, it'll be the other implementation. And that's basically how things are going to work under the hood. So the JVM sets all this stuff up when it compiles your code. And then at runtime, it figures out which method to actually call. Now, it turns out, of course, that there's also static methods uh, or static method dispatching, which are used for other kinds of methods. So private, final, and static are all optimized to be statically dispatched. And static dispatching doesn't use this indirection look up through uh, a pointer to a table to an index to find the method to implement. It simply encodes the actual method addressed to call into the bytecode. So it's more of a direct operation. And that, of course, is more efficient, because it's not an extra level or two of indirection. So here's a simple example. There's a method called eq that's part of abstract map. And eq takes two objects, and it goes ahead and checks to see whether they're equal or not. And that's a static method. So that method will be called directly. There's no indirection there. There's no going jumping through pointers and tables and so on. It's more direct. And for that reason, certain kinds of programs, especially ones where time is of the essence or dispatching predictability is of the essence, often use more statically dispatched approaches, whereas other things where you want flexibility and extensibility will tend to use dynamic dispatching. So again, if, if the right answer delivered too late becomes the wrong answer, you're probably going to gravitate towards statically dispatched stuff, or you'll probably use C or C++, not Java. Uh, in many other cases where it's less of an issue, you can use the dynamic dispatching, which gives you a lot more flexibility. OK, so that is the end of the overview of polymorphism.